A hundred years on from the end of the First World War, Turkey in turmoil, its currency crashing. A state of trade war now exists between the Turkish state and the United States of America. In case you'd forgotten, both of them are members of the military alliance, NATO. Indeed, both are constitutionally, by treaty, obliged to come to one another's defence, and we to theirs, and they to ours. And yet, if you viewed the rhetoric between Donald Trump and President Erdogan of Turkey today, you would think we were back in 1914. The Turkish president ordered his people to exchange all of their dollars, including those they sleep with under the pillow at nights, into Turkish lira as the Turkish lira fell off a cliff on the news of gigantic tariffs, 50% tariffs imposed on a whim by executive order, by Twitter, by Donald Trump. It's serious. Is Turkey the new Greece? Well, I suspect it is, as does Max Kaiser, my old economics guru, on Twitter this evening. We're trying to reach Max to get a word from him on this subject. If the Turkish currency collapses, the knock-on across the European Union, where it has a gigantic number of economic partners, and where, as you may recall from the Brexit debate, it sits on a list, an accelerated list of would-be entrants into the European Union. It sits also on the cusp of the great conflicts in Iraq and Syria, bordering both countries, imagine. And it has belatedly, extremely belatedly, taken a turn against Saudi Arabia and its ISIS al-Qaeda bedfellows, which may indeed be the cause of the crisis in the first place. Saudi Arabia, which murdered in cold blood dozens, either 40 or 50 small children on a school bus just 48 hours ago. If you didn't listen to this show last night and the night before, you possibly don't even know that. Can you imagine 40 50 school children being murdered by warplanes, dropping British and American bombs, firing British and American rockets. Can you imagine if the circumstances were different? If Saudi Arabia were, say, Syria or Russia, and if the rockets were Russian or Chinese, would this be a bigger story than it is this evening? Uh, on the British media. In The Guardian, the Bible <laughs> of liberals. Other than Owen Jones's column, they haven't even mentioned it. Nothing on the front pages of The Guardian online. Nothing in the international section of The Guardian online. I must say Owen Jones's piece, though he's not my favourite person, is a very powerful one indeed. But you've got to go all the way to comment. The comment is free section to find even The Guardian talking about one of the most heinous war crimes of recent years. I have struggled to find an example with one stroke, one strike, the lives of 40 or 50 infants, infants snuffed out in an instance. We'll be talking about Saudi Arabia and our grisly friendship with them. How could it be otherwise? We'll be talking about war, not just in the Middle East, not just the threat of war in the Middle East with Iran. In one day this week, one day, on the same day, Donald Trump slapped economic war sanctions on both Iran and Russia. 
almost in the same tweet, certainly on the same night. We'll be talking about the First World War, which, as regular listeners will know, I believe, contend, assert, was the greatest crime ever committed against the British people, and it was committed by our own rulers. A war that never needed to be fought. A war between three grandsons of Queen Victoria that could have sorted the whole matter out over Christmas lunch at Sandringham, but chose instead to send tens of millions of men into the maw, into the blood and gore and mud and atrocity in the trenches. Four long years it lasted. It led to the deaths of millions of people. And a hundred years ago this evening, it was finally hurtling towards a conclusion after the success of the Battle of Amiens and the new Allied tactics and armoury and technology that were deployed, the German armies, the armies of the Kaiser, were soon on the run and for the next 96 days or so were chased until they agreed to an armistice. It turned out, of course, that the First World War was merely a prelude to an even greater war. Indeed, we only call it the First World War because it was quickly followed by the Second. I'll also be joined in the middle part of the show with an absolute cult hero, Jimmy Dore. That's D-O-R-E. Look him up, because if you don't know him now, in the years to come, you'll be able to tell people you were among the first in Britain to have heard this brilliant and brilliantly funny man on the radio here on the mother of all talk shows with me, George Galloway. Little Stevie Wonder, it's a Stevie Wonder night. Why? Because on this day in, I think, 1963, yes, 1963, the then little Stevie Wonder became the youngest person ever to top the charts. Who could tell me what age he was? There you go. Get exercising uh, on the old uh, Google now. Apparently I'm in a Twitter storm, which started at 7 o'clock. Let's see how it's doing. Because Paul Booker says, whatever you think of him personally, no one can deny that George Galloway is a fantastic orator and spokesman. If you have any doubts, I urge you, no dare you, to tune in to the mother of all talk shows from 7 p.m. on talk radio. Thank you for that, Paul. I hope people are doing so. The hashtag is Bring Back Galloway, and I'm grateful to whoever it is that's organising that. Uh, your show, uh, George, Soaking Up the Sunshine in Tuscany, and I caught your show on YouTube. The political collusion in the U.S., which is being uncovered day by day, will be the biggest scandal in U.S. history, using Russia as a scapegoat to try and remove Trump. Every alleged action perpetrated by the Russians is just part of the jigsaw puzzle to take the emphasis off the real perpetrators assisted by the disgraceful media with Russian sanctions that are an absolute commercial and political farce. So Western companies can take over the supply of energy, weapons and technologies. When will our people wake up and see the truth? Do you honestly think the Russians will keep tolerating the absolute abuse and the attempted destru destruction of their economy? And that comes from the Russians who are with me in Tuscany. And that's signed Peter. Yes, I mentioned the sanctions earlier. Another matter that we discussed earlier and which uh, another of my predictions has already come true. I told you that uh, Boris Johnson's ugly, ill-intentioned, incendiary attack on the garb, the dress of some very small number of Muslim women would lead to trouble. I told you that Muslim women were already the victims of a greater number of racially and religiously motivated crimes in Britain than any other section of the population. And I've just seen a very, very ugly video indeed when a bus 
driver. A bus driver. Not some Robinsonite in the crowd. The bus driver stopped the bus when a woman in a niqab got on and refused to move the bus until she got off because, he claimed, she may be about to blow the bus up. Well, I'm pretty sure that bus driver is a bus driver no more. At least I hope so. Jimmy, time for Mr George Galloway on Talk Radio with the England versus India cricket on and then the rugby, though it's Wigan versus Castleford, both on mute. And thank you for last night. I read the BFG again last and I recommend One in a Million, a biography of the late, great Steve Prescott, MBE. Now, I mentioned that uh, one year ago, I think, maybe less, I interviewed Marco Gazic, 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 I think. Marco is a quite brilliant writer. He, he edited a book called Folly and Malice, which told the true story, not the fake news that we were brought up with by politicians and an establishment that bowed their head at the cenotaph waxed lyrical about the sacrifice of the men of the First World War, the Second World War, whilst busily planning in their heads what new war they could send our servicemen to. Marco Gazic's book, Folly and Malice, he tells the real story of how this war never needed to be fought. Moreover, I now know from other scholarship it could have been ended far earlier than it ended. So I thought, in this week of Amiens, we should return to this subject, because a hundred years ago this night, the First World War was finally, after the slaughter of millions, headed towards at least a temporary conclusion. Marco, welcome back to the show. Thanks, George. Great to be here. Um, now, you must have had mixed feelings like me as you watched the service in Amiens Cathedral. On one level, it was very moving and, uh, and very dignified, and all of Europe's uh, brass were there. Um, but you must have thought like me. They're commemorating the sacrifice of millions of lives that never needed to be lost. Am I right? Absolutely, you're right, George. Uh, it was a war that uh, was, uh, I mean, that was commemorated with all the high ups, and it was begun actually by all the high ups uh, 104 uh, or so years ago. It was a war that began from the top, from the elites that ran. Uh, a particular group of countries that were determined on war at that particular time. And uh, in that sense, it wasn't a reflection of what people thought, what the masses thought. It ignored the masses and it ended up killing the masses in masses. And those millions of people who died, as you say, died unnecessarily for a war that didn't lead to a particularly uh, useful conclusion uh, for most of Europe anyway. Indeed. Uh, just uh, explain part of the thesis of the book, uh, Folly and Malice, is that Serbia was fingered uh, for the assassination of the Archduke entirely falsely. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, John Zamatica, who wrote and researched it, has, has really uh, discovered a lot of uh, smoking guns and a lot of non-smoking guns. And one thing that becomes perfectly clear is... Uh, a, that Serbia had uh, had no desire for any kind of assassination of the Archduke, didn't want it to happen, and didn't and wasn't involved in it happening. And B, that Austria-Hungary, the big empire on the block, knew all of that before it declared war on Serbia under the fake news excuse that Serbia had been responsible for the assassination. So uh, Austria-Hungary had its inquiry, had its investigation. Uh, the investigator came back and said there is no evidence to show the complicity of the Serbian government in the assassination. In fact, there is lots of evidence to indicate the opposite. And having heard that, Austria-Hungary went ahead and uh, attacked Serbia anyway, bringing in Germany, which had uh, guaranteed to underwrite it if it did so, and therefore drawing in Russia, France, and then Britain as well in, as I say, a war that began with two countries who knew what they were doing and should have known better. 
And the result was what? What kind, I've said millions. What was the death toll in the First World War? And what were the uh, lasting consequences of, of it, Marco? Well, the, the war led to 17 million people approximately uh, dying on all sides, or rather being killed on all sides. I mean, there were masses of reasons. Some were mostly were military, most were military, but disease, hunger, there was a lot of factors in there. But uh, it was the era of the machine gun when it had come as a surprise to the established cavalry kind of commanders. So many people were killed on, on all sides before they realized just how dangerous the new weaponry was and then got themselves ensconced into trenches where they uh, remained for the rest of the war. Uh, the, as for the results of the war, in some parts of the world, they, uh, the war was viewed as a liberation because the empires that had uh, occupied uh, places like Czech, the emerging Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia and so on were no more. They were uh, punished by being, in effect, obliterated. So it was a, a new dawn for some countries. But for others, like Germany, uh, a myth took hold that they had been... Uh, that they shouldn't have surrendered, that they had been led falsely into a surrender decision and that they should try and right the wrong of the First World War uh, as soon as they could. And it was that logic that impelled Hitler uh, to begin the second one. So you could say that the biggest consequence of the First World War was actually the second, and it was the most brutal and uh, consequence of all. And that, uh, those two wars have defined our century and will define us uh, for centuries ahead. And the empires that crashed, what became of them? What became of the Austro-Hungarian Empire? Younger listeners tonight won't even know what you're talking about. Well, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was a, was a sprawling mass across uh, most of Eastern Europe, and it consists of about uh, 11 particular disaffected nationalities, none of which were very happy to be there, but some of which got more benefit from being there than others. But all of them, with the end of this Austro-Hungarian Empire, got uh, their own uh, states, their own national states, um, like Poland, like Hungary, like uh, Yugoslavia. They, uh, the Yugoslavia didn't uh, remain as such. It became a kind of Austro-Hungarian Empire in miniature, consisting of states that actually, of peoples that perhaps didn't get on and ultimately broke up again. So... Uh, in essence, though, the result of the Austro-Hungarian Empire's demise was to create new, a new map of Europe, uh, and many countries will to this day be pretty pleased with that result. But uh, a 17 million dead and another world war may suggest to us that it was perhaps a bit too high a price to pay. Uh, no. Certainly for Serbia, uh, which lost over half its adult male population half. in a in a war it didn't want uh, and tried to avoid at all costs, uh, that uh, that price was far, far too high. And Turkey, which is in the news again tonight, the uh, the Turkish Empire just dissolved in front of everyone's eyes, didn't it? Well, before the, uh, the Austria-Hungary was called the, the sick man on the Danube, but before the sick man on the Danube, there was the sick man on the Bosphorus, and that was the Ottoman Empire, which had been very uh, weak uh, for uh, decades prior to the uh, to the war itself. So really, the, the Ottoman Empire was on the way out anyway, and uh, the war simply confirmed that because uh, it, uh, it chose the wrong side. It chose the German side to ally with and, uh, and suffered consequences as a result. Uh, so all the, uh, the, uh, the German, uh, uh, in effect, the German allies were punished for their, for their joining in with Germany with loss of territory. And uh, historical questions and disquiet have remained to, in, in some cases to this day about that. So uh, history moves slowly and grinds slowly. We still haven't seen perhaps all the consequences of that disquiet. Extraordinary. A hundred years on. Marco Gazic, international affairs analyst and editor of a wonderful book which he gave me and which I read. It's quite a tome, but it is a magnificent, magnificent volume. It's called Folly and Malice. OK, 0344 499 1000. That's the number to call you. Call us. We'll call you back. Establish a clear line. It needn't cost you, therefore, more than a penny or two. We'll ring you back and put you on the radio. You can email me through the website at talkradio.co.uk. You can text the word TALK and then your message to 8722, though that will cost you 25 pence plus normal sending charges. You can tweet me for free 
at George Galloway at Talk Radio, as many are. Malcolm on the email says, George, great show. What's your view on this? To replenish our fish stocks, redundant dry docks should be used as fish farms instead of filling them with concrete and preventing a future return to shipbuilding in the UK. It's time for some common sense in the commons. Malcolm Jones, Politico. Very good idea, Malcolm. Uh, I'll second that. Uh, Matt says Stevie was 13. Quite right. Stevie Wonder topped the charts at 13 years old. No wonder they called him Little Stevie Wonder. Matt goes on, my all-time favourite singer. I hope you play more of him tonight. Well, I'll tell you what, Matt, just for you. I thought I was going to do it anyway. It's a Stevie Wonder night. And this from John Hodgkins. I've just witnessed the most affecting report on RT about the pregnant woman slaughtered by Israeli forces this week. The policy of our mainstream media to skim over such, such news or even ignore it altogether cannot be an accident. Somebody, some group, must be working in concert to ensure that the full picture as regards these never-ending atrocities is hidden from the British people. Everything looks far too well coordinated. Well, worse than that, the BBC changed their headline within minutes, minutes of a demand on Twitter by the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Is it any wonder that hundreds of thousands of people yesterday switched off the BBC, the great BBC switch off that the BBC didn't report? Ha! Disobedient slave says, couldn't agree more. Even if Galloway Student's an independent, he'd knock seven shades out of the so-called politicians in that place. Front bench, GG, obviously. Murray Black, bit of panaz. Dennis Skinner, poised at PMQs. In my humble opinion, of course, he adds. Thank you for that. Now, Robert, remember that guy from yesterday, Robert, on the email? Why do you, Mr. Galloway, and that pint-sized middle-class guardianista Marxist mate of yours, Owen Jones? Robert, I hate Owen Jones. He's never, ever, ever been my mate. Let me go on. Always demonise disenfranchised poor working-class white English males. Poor working-class white English males as racist, flag-waving Nazis and bigots. Do you and Owen Jones really think that winning the hearts and minds of poor working-class communities will get you anywhere by constantly insulting us away from the both of you, Robert? Away with the both of you. Mm, what do you mean by that, Robert? Are you going to uh, off us? What do you mean, away with both of you? Now, Robert... I realise you probably weren't much interested last night in Book Lovers, World Book Lovers Day. You're probably not a big book man, judging by the standards of your literacy in your emails. But the man you've just insulted, Owen Jones, actually wrote a whole book about the demonisation of white English working class males. He called it Chavs. It's quite a bestseller. Check it out, Robert. Then come back. Why don't you? Darren Thompson says, Two of my favourite shows I love is the mother of all talk shows and the Jimmy Dore show. Both are brilliant. Both keep fighting the good fight. And ask, is the miserable liberal still miserable? <laughs> You're an inspiration, George, to me. Thank you, Darren. Jimmy Dore coming up in the second hour. And Jazz says, George Gorgeous Galloway, sitting in the sun in Brighton after the rain. Boris should be made to wear a burqa and walk around a northern town. <laughs> he might get the message. It's no joke, really. What Boris Johnson did was simply unforgivable. And what happened on that bus today will not be the last. I saw reports today of louts pretending to post letters in the faces of Muslim women in Britain in 2018. There will be blood, unless I'm very, very wrong. Eugene Cook says, hashtag bring back Galloway. Now is the time for everyone to stand against the lies and untruths. 
George Galloway addresses things others won't. Thank you very much indeed, Eugene. It's not, you know, don't feel sorry for me. I'm doing fine. I've, uh, I've got uh, an audience of millions uh, every day, every week, on television, on radio, on social media, on blogs and so on. I'm, I, I get my view across. I don't have to be in Parliament uh, for that. But I was in Parliament and I was doing, I think, a good job in opposing the Iraq war, maybe too good a job. And that's why Tony Blair expelled me. And I cannot accept, and I will never accept, as long as God gives me breath, that Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell can be in the Labour Party whilst I have to be kicked out of it. So I'm demanding that my unjust, contrary to rule, and now, in the light of events, absolutely absurd expulsion from the Labour Party be rescinded. And that's what this uh, Twitter storm that's going on at the moment is all about. David says, all told, the UN says that more than 16,000 Yemeni civilians have been killed since the war began. And it's not hard to argue that the US is complicit. Not hard at all, David. And Denny says, the West is seriously worried about BRICS. That's Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. They threaten the capitalist empire of the West and then all the West will have will be armament manufacturing. Sleep tight, Blair. This on the news that Tony Blair has a new job. You thought there was not enough time in the day for Tony Blair to have a new job. Guess what his job is? He's now advising for £9 million per year the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. He's advising the man that murdered 40 or 50 children on a bus the day before yesterday. Now, if that's not bringing the Labour Party into disrepute, I don't know what it is. Boris speaks the truth about the burqa. It's daft, says unknown SMSR. And another... Um, his name is Ofsted, although I'm pretty sure he's not an educated man. Imagine if Galloway was allowed back in Labour. He would show the MSM to be the establishment's useful little idiots. I've got to say, Mr. Ofsted, I couldn't even read out your name because it would have been obscene. But thanks for the message. It's a nice one. Marie McFarlane says, please sign the petition pinned to my Twitter account. Cybrarian 64, that's Marie McFarlane, to rescind Warmonger Blair's expulsion of George Galloway back in 2003. He's on talk radio just now until 10 and has been all week. Hashtag bring back Galloway. Thank you, Marie. Uh, Alex in Cumbria says, George, I'm looking forward to the dedication of World War I. This, there is a great book called Hidden History, Secret Origins of World War I, which casts a different light on the reason why it started. I believe the British secret elite, Rhodes, Haldane et al., had a significant hand in it all over a period of 13 years after the death of Queen Victoria. All the best, sir. I'll look that up, Alex. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, a subject I'm, I'm greatly interested in. And the communicipalist says... Better not read this out, George, because Vince Cable, Chuka Amona, Anna Subri and Gina Miller are having secret meetings they call Project Ozark about their new back-together party. But strictly hush-hush, so mum's the word. Don't worry, communicipalist, it's just between you and me. Are they really going to call their party back-together? I mean, that's a, a real pound shop tribute act name, that one, isn't it? Hassan Diwan says, in your opinion... Is Yemeni blood cheaper than Palestinian? Well, Palestinian blood's pretty cheap, so you really would have to go to the blood pound shop to find cheaper blood. But Yemeni blood undoubtedly is now being shed in such volumes with so little accompaniment of wailing from the usual suspects that you have to conclude that because it's being shed, by such a valuable customer, we are prepared to ignore it. 
Uh, this useless government has a four-point lead over Labour. And another poll says that 77% of Labour voters want to remain. What do you think of that, Galloway? That's the 25 pence a text. 20, 30, 40 texts a night, gutless coward, that can't even put his name on the end of an SMS. Never mind, call up. There is no such poll uh, that shows 77% of Labour voters wanting to remain, that I'm aware of. And secondly, there are two polls in the newspapers this morning, though only one of them made it into the Times. The one that made it into the Times put the Tories four points ahead, but the one from, uh, what is it called, Govern Britain or Britain elects, Britain elects, I think it is, puts Labour one point ahead of the Tories. And theirs is an aggregate of polls and therefore much more valuable. Christopher Tomina says, listening to Galloway, like every Friday, from my desk at work in San Diego. Did I just hear Jimmy Dore is going to be on? Wow. First Ron Paul and now Jimmy. What great bookings this week. Yes, Christopher, he'll be right up shortly. One of my all-time faves. I remember dancing to it. It was on a jukebox in Morocco. 1974. Don't tell the wife she thinks so. I'm 45. And that'll be 46 next week. <laughs> Superstition, the great Stevie Wonder. This is a Stevie Wonder tribute night because on this day in 1963, at the age of just 13, imagine, 13, he topped the charts, becoming the youngest ever person so to do. Now, Turkey is in absolute turmoil this evening and may be about to suffer a Greek-style economic cataclysm. Chris is in Colchester. He's got a point of view on that. Let's hear it. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, George. Hi, yeah. mate. Happy birthday for next week. Thank you, way. Paul. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just... Turkey's an interesting one, really. Um, it's, it, it's it's difficult to know where they're going to go. And But I'll just go back to um, the 2013 uh, chemical attack. Um, I know you've said in the past you thought um, that, that the terrorists got the weapons from Israel or Saudi Arabia, but there was a video from, I think it was December 2012, and it's online, on LiveLeak. But um, they're, they're, I think it's the Free Syrian Army, they say they are, but they're sort of hooded with some jihadist music in the background. But they're, you, they're showing off all their chemicals that apparently came from Turkey and the yeah, yeah. in England. Well, mo most of, the, most of the, the killers and most of the material they used to kill came through Turkey. There isn't any doubt about that. Yeah. Um, and the writings in English, but um, I just got, and also James Le Mazurier, the the founder of the White Helmets, an ex British uh, intelligence agent. Mm -hmm. um, he he founded them in Turkey. And he founded also, the White Helmets, yes, in yeah, Turkey, yes. Yeah, and then Raed Salah, uh, the leader of the White Helmets, who um, who won a an Oscar, but funny enough, he wasn't allowed into the United States to collect the award because he's on the wanted list. He's uh, He's seen as a security threat, but he was on Russia Today uh, speaking on going underground last week. Le Mazurier was, in, yeah, I saw that. I haven't no, seen the uh, interview. Tell me about it. No, no, it was it was Raid Salah, the uh, the leader of the White. Oh, really? It wasn't Mazurier. Yeah. Okay. No, it was Raid Salah, and uh, he was interviewed in, and he's in Turkey as well. Um, and then Vanessa Bailey came on in the second half and just debunked everything he said. Mm hmm. But uh, you can't uh, again say that the United States government is now in open economic warfare against Turkey. Yeah, that's that's why it's it's very strange. I don't know what Turkey are going to do when uh, when all the action in Syria moves to Idlib, and then you know everyone's involved, all the jihadist groups there, Assad, Russia, and the the, the and Turks China. Well. China are sending troops too. Really, yep. and the, you know the Kurdish problem is going to become apparent as well because we know Turkey hates the Kurds, and uh, I don't know what Syria will do with the Kurdish population eventually. So it's all going to, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if there's another quote-unquote gas attack in Idlib. Well, of course, everyone's on the alert uh, for that, but uh, the 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 war is over uh, in Syria. They've lost, 
Um, yep. And wh- however long it takes to uh, liberate Idlib, the war is lost. I saw a stat today that two million Syrian refugees have already returned to their homes and another 850,000 of them are expected to do so by the end of the year. So the Syrian people are voting with their feet, going back to their country to rebuild it. Uh, Turkey uh, may turn out to pay uh, a very high price for the role that it's played in all of this. And it has just discovered that the United States is no solid and reliable friend, that's for sure. Chris, thanks for your call. And uh, a non-named texter says, all those sexy women hiding themselves, what a shame. Why do you think sexy women have got to show themselves to you, whoever you are? What obligation has any woman got to show herself to you, Mr. Gutless Coward? Darren in Leeds, George Daz from Leeds, did I hear you right? You have Jimmy Dore on the mother of all talk shows tonight. I think you'll like him, George. He's an unapologetic left anti-imperialist and exposes the establishment, no matter if it's liberal or conservatives. He also has a stylish hat like you. He's an American younger version of you. Hey, less of that. Would love to see you and Jimmy teaming up with Bernie and Jeremy. Really don't know what they're missing when they ignore great loyal supporters like you two. Uh, could an American Brit Galloway door team uh, door team up tour happen at some point in the future? I'll ask Jimmy that. I was on a show that he was comparing on RT America uh, just uh, very recently, a, a week or two ago. Uh, but uh, it was a rather stilted uh, panel discussion, so we didn't get the chance to interact all that much. We will this evening much more. But I'd love to tour. Galloway and Door, uh, here and there. It's a good idea. I'll put it to him. And Otta Benga says, I'm in New Zealand. An amazing people listening to us all over the world. Nothing on the news here about the 50 children killed by Saudi bombing. Disgraceful. Nothing at all, Otta. Isn't that astounding? 50 children killed in a bombing attack and nothing is on the news? Uh, David says, why did you or your guest not mention the decline of the British Empire after the First World War? The remnants of this empire can still be witnessed today. There remains a lot of deluded fools in the UK who think the days of empire can be brought back through Brexit. That's signed David. I don't know any such uh, fool because uh, our empire is gone for good. And when I discussed this uh, earlier in the week, With uh, Professor Churchill, I made the point uh, very clearly that the decline of Britain can be dated very exactly to the First World War. We didn't just lose the flower of a whole generation. We didn't just leave uh, huge numbers of, of spinster women, unmarried women, who therefore never had children, uh, because of the enormous death toll that our young men suffered. But economically, financially and economically, our decline began then, and we have never recovered some price to pay for a war. Georgina said, if I hadn't tuned in to George Galloway, I wouldn't have learned the horrendous news about the slaughter of those Yemeni infants by the Saudis using our weapons. And also, I understand, some of our military personnel. Indeed, that's true, Georgina. We have military officers, we and the United States, sitting in the command and control cell that is regulating and running the war in Yemen. Let's hear from our old friend Ken in Luton. Go ahead, Ken. I've got a little verse for your gutless wonder. OK, go ahead. A gutless wonder texts George every night. He won't ring in to have a fair fight. He hides behind a spell of secrecy. Every time it's costing him more than 50p. <laughs> Come on, gutless, if you think you're hard enough. Let's all hear if you're that tough. Come on, punk, make George's day. Pick up that phone straight away. That's beautiful, Ken. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's really very, very nice. I'll tell you what. We know he's gutless, and we know he's an idiot. Uh, 
but we also know he's loaded. Oh. Because I'm here to tell you that I've been on every night, as you know, this week. He has spent at least 50 pounds texting abusive texts at me. He's not even got the brains to, to realize that he could have done it free on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, thank you, my dear. Lovely, lovely call. Thanks. Appreciate it very much. Christopher Tomina says, GG, yesterday you said you're OK with Twitter axing Alex Jones. I just found out that Twitter suspended the Ron Paul Institute this month for a benign retweet. Censorship isn't a slippery slope, but an inevitable one. And Alex says, George, great show as always. I suggest you challenge the gutless texter to an old-fashioned duel. Highgate Cemetery under the shadow of Marx's tomb would be a good location if he or she were up to the challenge, Alex. Um, I'm too old for duels. Might turn out to be a 16-stone, 24-year-old. Uh, Pete says, Liberal Pete, George, I can't understand why the media is whipping up this burqa frenzy involving Boris Johnson for five days Boris Johnson for five days in a row now, which is doing nothing but causing more divisions between Muslims and non Muslims. We must calm things down and take a step back from this divisive rhetoric coming from both sides. I don't think I've heard much divisive rhetoric from the women in question, liberal. Pete, but then being a liberal, Pete, you've got to be one side and on the other, don't you? Peter in Glasgow uh, says, Mr. G, the local radio station are broadcasting. We are in the last moments of May. Surely the country won't stand by and let another 172 Tory MPs elect the bumbling Boris as the new PM. Satire, I think. From Peter Hedy says, George, you probably know about the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. I think the HQ is based in Ward 5 at Broadmoor. In my opinion, he's done enough global change, made Middle Eastern towns and cities a lot flatter. Very well, very well uh, uh, expressed. Salman says the way things are going between America and Turkey, it would be appropriate for Turkey with the second largest standing army in NATO to leave the alliance. You can't be in an alliance with a country that is hostile. It defeats the purpose. You're right, Salman. The second biggest land army in NATO is now being subject to withering, I mean economy-destructing economic sanctions from the country with the biggest land army in NATO. NATO, unity, don't make me laugh. And David says, while Khan did eventually let a lot of sunshine in by appointing the veteran MP Margaret Hodge to investigate the Heatherwick design schemes procurement and value for money, he seems to have once again closed the metaphorical blinds. I don't know what that means, David. Maybe it's a reference to the uh, bridge. Um, an unknown SMSer says, George, I think I'm in love with you. Russell says, war's past, war's present, war's future. What is it with humanity and its disgraceful obsession with killing, destruction and death? If we don't destroy ourselves or unless the Almighty intervenes, we don't deserve to survive. I'm ashamed to be part of the uh, so-called human race. And uh, here's from another texter, Clever Simon in Droitwich. You continue to inform and inspire, George. Bless you. Never surrender. Blair and co. will be sent packing one fine day. Well, I'm wondering if they're not, in fact, on the point of leaving. An extraordinary thing happened today. The former Scottish Labour leader, Jim Murphy, took out a paid ad, an entire page paid ad, in a newspaper I'd never heard of before called the Jewish Telegraph, in which he attacks Jeremy Corbyn in the most savage way for the obvious, fake, anti-Semite accusations against Corbyn, utterly baseless, vile, despicable. But also, he describes Jeremy Corbyn as politically maladroit, this is in a full-page ad. Now, not many of you know 
Jim Murphy. I've known him all my life. I've known him since he was a Trotskyite, believe it or not. Jim Murphy went into the general election in 2015 leading a group of 41 Labour MPs and came out with one. And that one wasn't Jim Murphy. He lost even his own seat, the leader of the Labour Party in Scotland. And he wants to attack Jeremy Corbyn as politically maladroit. Jim, if there's a gold medal for chutzpah, you just won it. Let me get him now before he disappears off this screen. I've been trying to get him for so long. Jimmy Dore, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. We were on a show together quite recently, but uh, it was dry economics and uh, neither of us uh, were able to properly interact with each other. So I'm glad to get you to myself Correct. this evening. Uh, at least uh, it seems like uh, myself and you, but uh, there are people I now can see tuning in from literally all over the world, from New Zealand, Australia, America, Canada, and, of course, all over Britain. So uh, you are now extremely famous in the United States. I think it would be fair to say you've gone from niche to cult to uh, a very, very big name uh, indeed. Uh, are they going to try and shut you down? Um, well, you know, they they have already tried in, in several different ways. I mean, at first there was the adpocalypse. So what they tried to do was take away our funding so we couldn't do our shows anymore. And they took away funding from independent news. And the next thing they did was they deranked us, meaning so now their algorithms, which are all made in secret, which is also a problem no one talks about, but their algorithms now are suppressing independent news voices, and they are, are now pushing establishment news sources like CNN. So uh, that's another way that they've already tried to come for us. Now, another way is that the, the Washington Post, which is owned by the richest man in the history of the world, he had a hit piece on anybody who was talking about the Seth Rich murder that was connected, that some people thought was connected with WikiLeaks, and they stuck me in the middle of an article with, filled with right-wing maniacs and Alex Jones types. And then CNN did the same thing to me, and it was because I'm against the Syrian war, or I was telling the truth about the Syrian war. They also put me in an article with, and then stuck me in the middle of an article of Nazis and public pedophiles and uh, the like like that. So they've tried to shut me down. They try to smear. It's exactly what they're, they've done to Julian Assange and Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning. And I'm not saying I'm in their category whatsoever. I'm just saying that the establishment has an agenda. And if you are become popular and a threat to that agenda, they will smear you and use any way possible to shut you down. Now, you've just teed up, actually, an area I wanted to talk to you about I happen to think Alex Jones is a raving madman. Uh, and when they took him off uh, various platforms, uh, whilst I wouldn't have advocated for it, I didn't shed any tears. But then I learned just an hour ago that Ron Paul, uh, who I had on this show earlier this week, that his institute was then taken down. And it's got me thinking, what should be our attitude to people that we profoundly disagree with, and that's understating it because people like Alex Jones say things which are so hateful, so filled with hate, that you really don't want to be in the same newspaper article as them. But should we defend them when the corporate owners of these platforms are taking them literally off the air? Well, I don't defend Alex Jones, but what I do is I defend the idea of free speech, which is a little different than freedom of speech in the United States. So freedom of speech is in Wisconsin, our First Amendment, it's in our Constitution. But for, and, and that applies to the government suppressing speech. And people are saying, well, this is, a, this is a private company, Facebook or YouTube, which is owned by Google, and they're suppressing free speech. So they're, they're allowed to do what they want. But it, this violates the principle of free speech, which came out of the Enlightenment, right? So no matter who's doing the oppressing, no matter if it's the government or a religion or a corporation, we're supposed to be against it in principle. And so I am. 
And so the the antidote to bad, hateful speech isn't censorship. The antidote to bad speech is good speech. So you have more speech. If you think if you think Alex Jones is spreading lies, you do a video on YouTube called Alex Jones is spreading lies or you put up a, a Facebook page called debunking Alex Jones. That's how it's supposed to work. That's the kind of ideals and values that people in a Western democracy are supposed to uphold and cherish and especially due process. So, you know, the, it also comes if I could go on just a little bit, it also brings up the idea of, well, in the United States, is Facebook, is YouTube, are they private companies or should they be considered what, what we call a public utility? Because they're so important to our culture now that we can't allow them to be ruled by the whim of a Silicon Valley billionaire. And I say yes. Of course, they are. everyone knows that these companies should have been broken up long ago. They have way too much power, way too much control. And I saw a statistic the other day that 70% of the people in America get their news from either Google or Facebook. So those are all the issues involved. And I stand up for free speech, the kind of ideal that all Western liberal loving democracies should be upholding and embracing. They're responding to the pressure of the deep state, aren't they? Indeed, they may even have already joined the deep state. Yes, it's no secret that Facebook, well, it is, I guess, a, a public secret. I mean, I know about it, that Facebook bends to the will of the government and the, to, and takes down Facebook pages all the time, uh, especially even not only the United States government, but the Israeli government. So if there's a Palestinian activist and they have a Facebook page, all they have to do is call the uh, Facebook and say, take it down, and it's done. They're doing it in the United States, too, with the help of a group called the Atlantic Council, now, if you don't know who the Atlantic... I do. I had is, one of them on this week on the radio. So they're all kind of these warmongering cretins who are responsible for most of the horrible stuff in the world. People like uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, Michael Chertoff, these kind of people who are warmongers responsible for all the horrible stuff that happens. They're on a board called the Atlantic Council, and they're in cahoots. They're in cahoots with Facebook. They're giving them the advice on what channels to take down, and uh, and so, you know, when you hear about Ron Paul and you hear about stuff like that, we might disagree with it. But I, I agree with Ron Paul's view on foreign policy. Yeah, me he's too. Not not on domestic, but on foreign. Yeah, no. Right. So he's a non. So I agree with Bernie Sanders in his domestic policy, but I'm not hot on his foreign policy. I don't like Ron Paul's domestic policy, but I'm hot on his foreign policy because he's a, he's an anti-interventionist, which was a reason why a lot of people supported Donald Trump, even though they knew he was an incompetent, loudmouth, jackass Yankee who should have got his butt kicked a long time ago, is what one coal miner ta- told me. But but uh, he was actually promising things to people like good jobs and anti-interventionism overseas and ending the wars in the Middle East that we started. He's not doing that. In fact, he's doing the exact opposite. Well, uh, there's a certain telepathy between you and I, maybe as one of the tweeters earlier suggested, we should take this on tour, Jimmy, uh, because okay. that was my next question. It was my second dilemma. Uh, I said at the time, I predicted that Trump was going to win, practically the only person in Britain who did so. And I said when he won that I'm not happy that Donald Trump is the president of the United States, but I'm extremely happy that Hillary Clinton isn't the president of the Uh, United States. Does that sum up your view, too? That exactly summed up my view, because it was predictable what was going to happen if Hillary Clinton was president. Uh, the income inequality was going to be widened. It was going to get worse. Uh, globalism was going to be expanded. Neoliberalism was going to be expanded. And, and so were the wars. I mean, she's the she's a bigger war mark. She's like George Bush. You know, she's a big she's she claimed that Hillary, uh, Henry, you know, Henry Kissinger is one of her best advisors on foreign policy. Henry Kissinger. So, yeah, I'm super glad that Hillary Clinton didn't become president. And uh, because uh, because now we have a chance and in. in the progressives are kind of seeing Donald Trump puts an ugly face on the horrible stuff that the United States government has been doing for a long time. Just yesterday uh, in the United States, MSNBC, which is considered the big left wing uh, on a television news network, they haven't talked about Yemen literally in over a year. Not one news report on Yemen. Well, yesterday, uh, not the, even the 50 States children States. killed yesterday in the bus. So that was the first time they talked about it in over a year. So I'm like, well, 
now that Trump has ramped up the violence in Yemen, finally they're talking about the horrible stuff the United States is doing with the help of Saudi Arabia in Yemen. So that's the only silver lining behind Donald Trump is people are now more aware of what their government's doing, like when he was separating families at the border coming in from Mexico and taking children away from their parents. People were tweeting out pictures of cages that they were holding those children in, and they were upset about it, except those pictures were from 2014 because Barack Obama's policy was to put those people in cages and separate them. So now people are aware of the stuff that Barack Obama and George Bush and the Democrats and the Republicans all have been in cahoots over for the last 20 years. So now people are waking up to that. And so, yes, that's why I'm glad Hillary Clinton is president. Well, Madeleine Albright uh, got all tearful about separating children from their parents, but she thought it was a price (laughs) worth paying to separate half a million children from their parents forever in the sanctions on Iraq. You know, I don't say this lightly, but people like Madeleine Albright are sociopaths. And I really don't say that lightly, but... If you can be, you know, when you're instituting a policy that is causing genocide, that is causing massive deaths of children. So when 500,000 children were killed because of our sanctions on Iraq, she was asked that question by Leslie Stahl. Hey, do you think it's worth it? And she said, yes, it's worth it. She later went on and said she regretted saying that. She only regretted saying that because everybody in the world castigated her for it and held up a mirror to her. But that's how she really feels. That's how these people are warmongering maniacs and they're in charge of our foreign policy. And, you know, that, it's just like Wall Street. The people who rise to the top at Wall Street are the most psychopathic, the people with the least amount of empathy, because that's what gets rewarded. It was the same thing in politics. The people with the least amount of empathy, the most psychopathic, the most the most the people with the biggest bloodlust are the people who rise to the top in politics. And Madeleine Albright is certainly one of them. And yes. Isn't it amazing how she can now all of a sudden she has her humanity when it comes to children. But when she was actually in charge of killing them, she didn't give it there. Now, what's happened to the left in America? The left for decades was the victim of and the chief critic of the CIA, the FBI, the deep state agencies. They were witch hunted as reds under the bed. Now, They're seeing Russians under every bed. They're trying to pin everything on Russia, which they mistakenly believe is still red, uh, when, of course, it isn't. Um, It's like the left and right switched places, Jimmy. It's it's really wild what happened. So it's it's so funny. I mean, this is a case study in how uh, propaganda works. You know, Uh, I was too young to... We had a thing in the United States, a red scare in the 50s, which was promulgated by a senator called Joe McCarthy. And he would accuse everybody of being in cahoots with Russia. And we were afraid that Russia was going to take over our country. And they and they used it to to suppress workers and unions. And if you were a union leader, you got your job was taken away. If you were a lefty writer in Hollywood, you were blackballed, stuff like that. So that's come back around, but it's being propagated by the left because of Donald Trump. So Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton. So the Democrats couldn't admit that they're such a horrible party, so inept and so repulsive to most of the voters in America that the biggest and strongest and most well-funded political machine in the history of the United States lost to a political novice game show host. And yes, they did. So they couldn't accept that. And in the book, The book called Shattered, which details the Clinton campaign, at the end it's revealed that they came up with this Russian narrative to try to distract everybody because exactly what I said, they couldn't accept blame for losing to Donald Trump. And they pushed it, and and their minions in the media pushed it because the media does not want to examine the system that gave us Donald Trump. And that's what I keep telling people. I want, you know, I, on my show, I'd rather criticize the system that gave us Donald Trump instead of criticizing Donald Trump, because he is the logical conclusion to 40 years of neoliberalism in the United States, which has thrown workers off over the, the boat, right? They've thrown them overboard. Well, here's what's happening in America. So we're the richest country the history of the world has ever seen, and half of its population are poor or low income. 
63% of the people in America can't afford a $1,000 emergency, and 30 million Americans still don't have health care in the richest country in the world. That's why we got Donald Trump. And that's got nothing to do with uh, Putin. That's got nothing to do with Russia. That's got nothing to do with Facebook memes. That's got to do with neoliberalism screwing over an entire populace at the behest of the 1%. That's what's happening. And is it going to work? Are they going to get Trump? And what would happen if they do? Let me posit this hypothesis to you. If Donald Trump is brought down by a deep state coup by the Mueller uh, investigation machine, the 35% of Americans who really, really love him there's more going to vote for him, but 35%, let's say that's his core vote. A lot of them have got guns. There could be serious trouble in America, no? Oh, well, yes, that's what I... I had actually said something similar about that. Uh, no, I don't think Donald Trump will be impeached uh, because as the former director of the CIA, Mike Morell, said, if there was evidence of collusion between Donald Trump and the Russian government, it would have already leaked. We would already know about it, and it would have already leaked. And since it hasn't leaked, it leads that guy, Mike Morell, former head of the CIA, to say that there isn't any evidence and there never will be any evidence. So if you follow it closely in the United States, they're starting to indict people. So they indicted Trump's former campaign manager, Manafort, but they indicted him on stuff that happened before he ever worked for Donald Trump. It's got nothing to do with the campaign. It's got nothing to do with Donald Trump or collusion or Russia or anything. But the headline is Manafort is uh, indicted, Manafort charged. So people only read the headlines and they don't read eight, eight paragraphs down that says this has nothing to do with the election and has nothing to do with the Trump campaign. This is just, So that's really what's happening here in the United States. I don't think they're, they're going to... So, we, and what we learned from Bill Clinton's investigation, I don't know if you remember that back Yeah, then, very is well. They did, so they put a guy named Kenneth Starr, who was a, a law professor, to investigate a land deal in Arkansas and a travel gate uh, office. Uh, and what it ended up was, was, uh, was hinging on oral sex that he got from an intern in the Oval Office. So we learned that if you put a special investigator on anybody in Washington, D.C., you're going to find a litany of crimes because they're all greasy and they're all in the same system. So after Bill Clinton, they got rid of the special prosecutor. They didn't bring it back until Donald Trump, ironically. Why? Because both sides of the aisle, both sides of the neoliberals, don't like Donald Trump because he's not in their club. But he will remain president for as long as he does the bidding of the, of the establishment, the military-industrial complex, and Wall Street. And boy, is he doing their bidding. They've ramped up the military budget to over $700 billion a year, and they deregulated Wall Street again. So he's not going anywhere. Now, is there any hope in the Democratic Party? Bernie Sanders, his rotten foreign policy notwithstanding, uh, was, uh, was a hero for a time. Uh, but then he, he, when he was cheated of the nomination, he fell tamely into line. He's uh, very old uh, for uh, elected office. Is he going to run again? Is there anybody else? Is there another Bernie Sanders coming up the track, male or female? Um, Bernie Sanders, is. if I had to make a prediction, I would say yes, he's definitely running. Um, otherwise, I could not explain his uh, obsequiousness to the Democratic Party. He spent his entire career, he's now in his late 70s, he spent his entire career uh, uh, extolling the, the inadequacies of the two-party system and saying that there isn't a difference between the parties and lamenting that, that people feel like they have to waste their vote because independents can't win. By the way, he's a senator in the United States and uh, he is he runs as an independent yes. every time he runs for office. So I don't understand why he's not starting a third party, an independent party, because he's been preaching it his entire career. And the only thing I can think of is because he knows the Democratic Party establishment and the media are too powerful and they'll just cheat him again. And so he's trying to play along with them. So he'll have a chance at the Democratic nomination in 2020. But. You know what? If he doesn't win the nomination, which I don't think he will, because they're going to cheat him again. 
And even the corporations are not going to let progressives take over the government. And that's just the way it is. You know, here I live in California. And this is a perfect example, George. In California, so we only have the two parties in the United States that are viable, right? The Republicans and the Democrats. Well, in California, we're all very what they call liberal, right? So uh, all, we have a supermajority of Democrats in the state legislature. So they can do whatever they want. The Democrats have the governor of the state. And they have the state assembly and the state Senate. So they control the entire apparatus of politics in the state of California. And guess what? We have a pro-fracking governor. We still don't have single payer. The Democrats killed it. We don't have free college in California. The Democrats killed it. So we don't And net neutrality. The Democrats just killed that in California. So what happens when you have the Democrats are the one party rule in California and everybody thinks they're the antidote to the Republicans and Donald Trump? What happens is corporations just take all their money and they give it to the Democrats and now they own them. So the problem in our country is the way we finance our elections and we finance it through corporate cash, which is why the people voted for Donald Trump, because neither party represents them. And that's why Bernie was so popular, because he actually represented people. It wasn't because he was handsome or dress sharp or was sexy to the women. He was a 76 year old bald guy running around in brown suits. And uh, people were filling stadiums for him because they liked his message. And his message was the government's going to actually represent you and try to help you, which is what, not what's been happening for the last 40 years since Ronald Reagan. Jimmy, I've been uh, doing uh, radio from this building for 15 years. I, I, I don't recall ever having a more articulate and fascinating guest as you. Sadly, we're running out of time Uh, How can those equally impressed listening to this, how can they follow your work? Which platforms can they find you on? So I'm at uh, jimmydorecomedy.com, and my last name is spelled D-O-R-E, jimmydorecomedy.com, or at the YouTube, it's it's to the Jimmy Dore Show on YouTube, D-O-R-E. So those are the two best places. Of course, I'm on Twitter, Jimmy underscore Dore. But, uh, yeah, I'm very easy to find right now until they deplatform me. Jimmy, let's go on tour coast to coast. Thanks very much indeed for joining me here on the mother of all talk shows. Stevie Wonder night. Wasn't that a wonderful interview with the wonderful Mr. Jimmy Dore? Everyone, check him out. He's hilariously funny, brilliantly scathing, and he punches up, not down. Note to British satirists. Hey, I'm trending. Number four in the UK. Hashtag bring back Galloway. Let's try and get it up from four closer to number one, shall we? Mike is in Westport in Ireland. Mike, welcome to the show. Hello, George. How are you? Good, thank you. Nice to hear from you, sir. I love your show. and I, I, I actually like you very much yourself. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I want to talk about a few things, but uh, coming from the west coast of Ireland, you know, I, I, it's a long distance away from you, and 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 you, you, we're kind of an estranged people in some ways or other. But I just know you, just your view on on Brexit and, and how it's going to affect Ireland. Uh huh. Well, uh, Ireland wants to remain in the European Union, north and south, so that seems to me like a very good opportunity. Uh, to begin the process necessary to bring Ireland back together as one country uh, when it was torn asunder in the British colonial period. Uh, and it's time to undo that uh, that great crime, uh, which Ireland has suffered uh, for uh, hundreds of years from British colonialism. So if, uh, if you can persuade, and I believe they are eminently now persuadable, enough who formerly had their loyalty to the Union and transfer that to a loyalty to the European Union, I'll be quite happy about that. But as soon as that happens, I'll start pointing out to the Irish people, as I did to the British people, all the reasons why I believe the EU is a very, very bad thing. Uh, uh, George, there are so, 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 so many subjects I'd like to talk to you about, but... Coming, coming on to that, and I, I understand what you said about Ireland, but I'm talking about Germany now, right? Mm-hmm. And with regard to Germany, what they did in World War I, um, they failed to do. 
what they did in World War Two, they failed to do. And third time out, they're doing economically. And I think that Germany rules the, rules the European Union. Yeah, the, the EU is principally for uh, the agriculture of France and the industry of Germany. But Germany, but Germany rules the roost. Anything. I, I know a woman, a woman in, in Brussels. I worked for, uh, and 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 she, she 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 her name was von Bismarck actually, and uh, she she said she said to me, Mike. Anything that, any decision that's made in Brussels has to go to Berlin first. Yeah, well, they are obviously the strongest uh, and leading power in the European Union. Uh, fair play to them. They're very hardworking and successful people. I just don't want to be ruled by Germany. And, neither, uh, neither, and neither, neither, a lot of our people I, uh, gave their blood. An Irishman. Uh, a lot of the, our people gave their blood to avoid that. And neither do I as an Irishman. Well, uh, in that case, we're on the same uh, wavelength. But uh, we'd have to acknowledge, Mike, that uh, the majority of Irish people, uh, because Ireland has been a a net beneficiary of membership, uh, the majority of Irish people at this point in time would never vote to leave the European Union, especially as Sinn Féin, the national party, have done a vault fast. George, George, we, we have a corrupt government here. Uh, well, we've got corrupt governments everywhere, Mike. Well, well it makes me both of sad. And, and the third thing, uh, sure, there's 155 things I want to talk to you about, George. But Not tonight, no, just about, give me Yugoslavia. one more. Yugoslavia. Yes. And and in Yugoslavia, now, now it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. And Serbia, and I know, you, I know you, you're all fair with, with what went on. In, in this region of the world, in the Balkans, and it, it, it breaks my it breaks my heart because I spent a lot of time in Serbia and in occupied Kosovo. And what the Germans did, because the Germans they hated they hated the Serbs for for, for so so many reasons, I don't know. But in the Second World War, the, the thing was that oh, they mustn't die Serben vernichten. That's a German saying, which we must annihilate the Serbs. That was the, second, that was the First World War. The Second World War, they said, die Serben müssen sterben. The, the Serbs must die. And, and um, in the Second World War, I know that they, they blocked their, their attack on the, on the Eastern Front into Russia. Well, uh, the Yugoslav partisans, led by a Croat uh, by the name of Tito, one of the greatest men of the 20th century, tied down 13 German divisions, and Yugoslavia was uh, one of the, uh, I think, in fact, the only country in Eastern Central Europe that liberated itself without any need for the Red Army to do it for them. Mike, thanks uh, very much for that. Shen Braskin says, I can't remember how I discovered Jimmy Dore, but I am a devoted fan of his now. Have been a fan of yours since the famed Senate hearing. Still rewatch that from time to time. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Let me get, let me have some more calls, yeah? 0344 499 1000. 0344 499 1000. You call us, we'll call you back and put you on the radio. Email me through the website at talkradio.co.uk. Text me. Text the word TALK and then your message to 8722. That'll cost you, though, 25p plus normal sending charges. Or you can tweet me at George Galloway at Talk Radio. Now, Hassan says, Talk Radio need to find Yemen on a map. You know, Yemen is a very beautiful and historic place. Arabia Felix, it was called in the old days. The British don't need to go and look at a map to find it because we used to rule it. Indeed, it was one of the very last colonial battles that the British uh, fought. I think in 1967, it might have been 68, uh, the summers of love. Uh, We were shooting down Yemenis in the streets of the Crater District in Aden in the south of Yemen. Alex from Stoke-on-Trent says, George, thanks for the lesson on Serbia and how World War I started. I am of Serb descent and many times been told they started World War I. 
My parents were born in Croatia and came here after World War II following atrocities by the Croatian Ustasha. That's the fascist formation in Croatia. They never lived to see the last war, maybe just as well. About Boris Johnson, I'm, I myself was nearly run over by a woman wearing a veil driving a car. She couldn't see me or the traffic lights. I don't particularly like them, but I agree with you there are more serious things to worry about. They certainly should not be allowed when driving, though. I'm presuming it wasn't covering her eyes, was it, Alex? Uh, John says, I bet Jimmy Dore tells jokes about Christians and Catholics, but would not dare tell jokes about Islam and Muslims. The hypocrisy and double standards from these left-wing comedians is mind-blowing. You've obviously never seen his act, John, in Croydon. What I think you mean is that Jimmy Dore uses his comic genius to punch up at those with wealth and power, not down with those who have neither. Georgina says, just spotted that Jeremy Corbyn has tweeted about the devastating murders of those little Yemeni children, as had Emily Thornberry, but no word from Theresa May nor Jeremy Hunt. I guess it's cause the latter are complicit in it. It is a scandal beyond words that the British government have still not said a word about 40 or 50 children being murdered. Uh, John Paul says, uh, GG, would Boris Johnson's comments on the burqa be taken so lightly if directed towards our burqa-wearing ultra-Orthodox Haredi Jewish sisters as opposed to our burqa-wearing ultra-Orthodox Muslim sisters? Islamophobia is frighteningly acceptable in modern Britain. That's from John Paul, and of course it's a point I made repeatedly uh, this week. Um, from my point of view, Jewish women... Muslim women are entitled to wear exactly what they like. Lizzie says, uh, Imperator Georgius, Tone Deaf Blair and Alex Campbell, Alistair, I think you mean, Liz, ought to face impeachment for the destruction of the Labour Party. And how dare Blair expel you for your stance on the Iraq war when Hans Blix and his team of weapons experts could find no further arms or chemical dumps. Thanks, Lizzie. Hope you've uh, tweeted in my Twitter storm. Scouser Lar says, being attacked by Jim Murphy is a badge of honour for Corbyn because the man is one of the biggest failures in the history of the Labour Party. And Fihel says, it's probably Boris Johnson texting you anonymously, George, whilst getting the worst for wear, if you know what I mean. Maybe he's Boris Johnson in a burqa. Paul Booker says, keep it going, folks. Hashtag bring back Galloway is currently trending in the UK. Keep tweeting and retweeting. Angela, Mac Angela McElvoy says, hashtag bring back Galloway. Tells it as he sees it. What more could you want in a politician? He also has such a sexy voice on talk radio. And Jack, no, David, congratulations on having an entertaining progressive lefty in the form of Jimmy Dore on your show. Makes a great change from your boring right-wing friends in recent weeks. My boring right-wing friends? Whomever can you mean? Simple Simon's back. The mother of all egos, back on talk again. Why are you listening, Simon? That's what nobody can understand. You hate me so much... You've listened to every show, every minute of it, all week, and fired in these kind of tweets. Anyway, he goes on. Uh, it's as niche as any show could be. Galloway and his fan club should be on a local London radio station. Well, Simple Simon, let me tell you something. This is a very, very big niche. As... Winston Churchill once said, when Hitler said he was going to wring our neck like a chicken, he said, some chicken, some neck. Hey, I'm moving on up. I'm up to number three. I'm trending at number three on the Twitter. Hashtag bring back Galloway. Steve Topple, my mucker, says, I just popped back to find hashtag bring back Galloway trending. But would my partner in commentating crime... George Galloway go back to Labour anyway. Maybe we'll discuss it on next week's hashtag Topple Galloway. 
or you could tune in to Moats on Talk Radio to find out. Uh, thanks, Steve. X-Ray Vision says, never been into Alex Jones or his show, but when they took him off all the major platforms, I thought it was the beginning of something bigger and more sinister. Any voices the establishment don't like are now a target. And Tony X, the protest board, who I think has set up a rival to Twitter, if I understood last night's conversations uh, properly, and I do want to talk to him about that, Tony. You need to call in so we can speak to you. I was talking with Lizzie earlier, he says, and I asked her if it was weird that I'd never heard of Jimmy Dore. She very swiftly put me right, and for that I thank her. And you, by the way, hashtag bring back Galloway. Thank you very much, Tony, for that. Let's hear from David in London. Go ahead, David. Oh, hello, George. Nice to hear from you. What would you like to yeah. say? Well, it's about the, 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 the British media and the coverage of the, the slaughter of the children in Yemen. Yes. Uh, I haven't, I mean, I, I haven't watched BBC News programmes for quite a while now because uh, they're so atrocious. Um, I switched to ITV at times and I was presently, well, I don't know if presence the word, but ITV News at 10 yesterday was uh, read by Raggy Omar, and they, they led with the uh, atrocities. Uh, very good, very good. And, uh, well, I, ITV is much better than BBC, and yeah. Sky, believe it or not, is much better than either of them, both yes. of them. Well, the, the, but, but he pointed out uh, carefully the role of the British government in, uh, with Saudi Arabia and the Saudi arms being used, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the, big, that's the big element to the story. So what kind it. of journalist in Britain isn't interested in the fact that British weapons killed 50 children yesterday? Well, quite, quite. But as you pointed out, and I agree with you, the, the state of British journal, investigative journalism, well, it's, it's virtually nil. Um, it is, yeah. I mean, they, they, everybody they hates them. Everybody stories. hates them. And, and, and no wonder. I well, mean, they've really made a, a gigantic... Uh, rod for their own back, you know, with this. This Corbyn story is utterly unbelievable. I mean that in the literal sense. It is incredible in the literal sense. No, I've been in politics 50 years and I've never seen anything remotely like this. I agree, I agree, because they're just accepting completely whatever those, uh, the, you know, the, the Labour people or their, spo their spokesperson... The Blair, the Blair uh, ramp. Exactly. They just repeat it ad nauseum. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, I, it's even it worse, atrocious. even worse, David, I can assure you, because The Guardian, for example, uh, undoubtedly went looking today for somebody to attack Corbyn well, in case it was running business. out of steam. Yeah. And that person penned a swift piece to say, stop hiding Jeremy Corbyn. Hiding? My God. Hiding? Apart from the fact he's on holiday, like much of the country, yeah. he's actually still working, still tweeting, still highlighting well, exactly. these children in Yemen, for example, yeah, yeah. as has just been pointed out. Yeah, I, I, would, I think I'd rather read The Telegraph. Than the, with The Telegraph, I know where they're coming from. The Guardian of the Great Misleaders, a lot of people are duped and taken yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. The number of people I've said, read the Morning Star, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't, maybe now and again. It is, it's quite, there it is, wonderful newspaper. But um, Oh, can I say one more thing about the ITV? Yes. Um, I watched their London news at six, and th from after, the, after Grenfell... Nearly every day they featured somebody from the grand, you know, uh, the victims of the ta of the fire, whereas the BBC were simply talking to so-called experts. Yeah. So again, that shows the difference. Not uh, fit for purpose, David. Yeah. Definitely not fit for purpose. Thanks very much for that call. Uh, here's an SMS from Miller. Uh, certain higher echelon politicians backed by so-called royals, corporate leaders, rich lords, judges and bankers, force austerity down the throats of the masses, saying that there is no illusory money for nothing, stressing how we need more cuts on everything. Meanwhile, they have unlimited money for weapons 
of mass destruction, multi-millions, actually billions, Miller, to bail out bankers, pay for weddings for extremely wealthy royals, swan around in jets, helicopters and fancy cars, eat fancy foods at huge banquets, pose for swarms of paparazzi like pop stars. Then they wonder why the streets are crazy out here and man them are fed up. Uh, I think that's pretty powerfully described. And this from our uh, wise friend Samson in Kilmarnock. George, I'm a big fan of Jimmy Dore and I highly recommended his YouTube show to your listeners. Jimmy has excellent insights into the functioning of the US system and cuts through the obfuscations of liberal identity and personality politics. As he will tell you himself, though, it's a great pity that comedians are required to assume the media's role of holding power to account, whilst the media assume the role of the power being held to account. Brilliantly expressed, I must say. This Life says fascinating mother of all talk shows tonight on talk radio and good callers again. I agree with the caller Mike would like to discuss here George Galloway on many, many, many topics. Caller Mike covered three. He has only 152 to go. Hashtag bring back Galloway every night to talk radio. Thanks, this life. Let's hear from Pat in East London. Go ahead, Pat. All you had from Ireland? Yes. Uh, he was talking about, like, you know, the Germans rule Europe. Yes. Well, this was no accident. I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Red House report. No. Well, in the closing... Mum, well, I think in it, I, what I read about it, it was in November of 1944 that the Germans knew that they were beaten. And top industrialists, economists, and even a few German generals met at a secret location to plot Germans, re, Germany's revival as a, a military and industrial um, uh, and as an economic power after the war, and that they would rule Europe or have a lot to a lot of say in the running of Europe, you know, as a, a, the country they are today. And this was no accident. This was, you know, that they... Well, uh, to be fair to them, Pat, they certainly haven't uh, become a military power. And no, indeed, I mean, they as have... an economic and industrial yeah, power. Yeah, they've, they've acted as a restraining fact. They refused to join the Iraq war, for example, uh, mm. as did France. But uh, Germany is being encouraged by Western journalists like Andrew Neil, for example, who banged on for weeks about Germany spending far too little on its military. So we've got people demanding Germany get more militarily powerful. What could possibly go wrong? But you're absolutely right. Their industrial manufacturing power is the reason they dominate the European Union. And as I say, good luck to them. I love German people. I've got nothing against them at all. I just don't want to be ruled by them. But that, that's why I voted to come out of Europe. Um, but as you say, <clears throat> Germans' constitution was that they could... You know, well, I mean, uh, the Allies said that they could never be powerful again militarily. But now they want, they, they want mil German to beef up their military. So... You know, they can't have it two ways, can they? No, quite. Uh, although, amazing number of people try to. But thanks very much for the call, my friend. Helen Ady on our website says, Hi, George, I've seen Facebook memes praising Boris for speaking the truth and accusing the left of suppressing free speech. I saw a further post from a cleric saying Boris had nothing to apologise for as the burqa is a tool of oppression for women. Whilst women have always made a point of philosophising over women's attire, and there may indeed be a debate to have, the fact is Boris used dehumanising and criminalising similes to compare Muslim women to, one of the most oppressed groups of women in our nation. If we said it to someone at work, we'd be sacked, and rightly so. Long over time, long time overdue, Boris should go. It's been a great week of extra university sessions, George. Thank you so much, Helen. Helen A.D. writing uh, to our website. Uh, that's exactly the point. I don't like burkas. 
I see no scriptural Quranic justification for burqas at all. The vast majority of Muslim women would never be found dead in a burqa. The vast majority of Muslim women would never be found dead in a niqab. Actually, a very substantial number of Muslim women don't wear the hijab, which is merely the kind of headscarf that the Queen routinely wears with her green wellies out uh, on the moors around Balmoral. There is absolutely no justification for singling out in an incendiary way a small group of women, almost all of them from racial minorities and obviously from a religious minority, for the kind of humiliation and even attack which those women are now suffering this day. On video, everyone can see it. Everyone knows that words like Boris Johnson wrote lead to trouble, and they could even lead to blood. Uh, here's a text from Clever Simon. Simple Simon brings shame upon our name. I apologize, George, on behalf of Simons everywhere. Thank you. Cameron says, Hi, George. First time I've switched to your show, and so far I'm glad that I have. I've recently read that government is planning to bury nuclear waste underneath national parks. And as shocking as this news is, I have not seen much about it. Please shed a light on this and let your listeners know your thoughts on this matter. Thank you. Your new listener, Cameron. Not David Cameron, no. Cameron's his first name. Cameron, I, I don't know that story. I haven't heard it. If anyone's got further and better particulars, I'd love to receive them. Eugene Cook, FCIPS. What does that mean, Eugene? Says, hashtag bring back Galloway. Shocking that Tony Blair can become such a mercenary. Shocking but not surprising, Eugene. The world is ill-divided, and these mercenary millionaires just stand by and pocket the money while the poor suffer from unjust wars and economic destruction. Shame on him. Shame on him, indeed. And I would like to say to those people who continue not just to long for Tony Blair, but to act for Tony Blair, are you content this evening? You 100-plus Labour MPs that broke the Labour Party's three-line whip in order to protect Saudi Arabia from an arms embargo from Britain. How do you feel tonight as you see these pictures? Because you will look at them, won't you? You will watch the videos, chaps and chapesses, won't you, of the children broken torn asunder, bleeding, screaming, and dying in the Yemen, in the bus. Guy is on the line in Stoke-on-Trent. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Guy. Good evening, George. Good evening, sir. Uh, George, it's just to let yourself and your listeners know what a total non-story the, the Yemen massacre was yesterday and last night. Mm -hmm. uh, during your program last night at about 9 p.m., I decided I wanted to read some more about the, the massacre. So uh, I foolishly logged on to bbc.co.uk, sorry, bbcnews.co.uk, the website, the BBC New we News website. Um, on the latest news section, which contains at least 36 stories, um, Two, the, the big one was the, 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 the cricketer come boxer. There was also a massive story on how to curtsy. Uh, I ignored those and I was looking for the international stories. And they did cover some international news. There was stories of Barcelona, Italy, earthquake in Indonesia, the, the USA, Russia sanctions, um, a, story, a story from Norway. And there was not one single mention of Yemen it's on It's utterly there. shameful, that. It is, it's unbelievable. You just... Have they got I a death wish or what? You know, given that we have to pay for them and it's not cheap, 
and we'll go to jail uh, potentially if we don't. I mean, what are they trying to do? Are they trying to inspire a nationwide revolt of switching off the BBC literally? Is that what they're trying to do? Because that's how they're acting. Well, it's got to the stage now in my household where we won't watch the BBC news. Uh, the, the, the political output from them is... is so, biased. so abysmal, yeah. If, if it weren't for the sport, uh, I would cancel my licence. Oh, Sky That's Sport. what it's Sky down Sports, to. for me, I'm afraid. I don't even watch their uh, sport. I really don't. Do you want to just make yeah, go on. one other point? Yes, uh, go on, sir. Yeah. We've um, we've discovered a couple of days ago that the wealthiest man in the UK, Sir Jim Ratcliffe... He was mentioned worth... last night. Who is he? How did he get to be so wealthy without me knowing he's, who he was? He's, yeah, I'd never heard of him. Patrick Chemicals, he's, 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 he's gone around buying oh, businesses. yes, and... yes, yes. So, didn't he? Didn't he bit. buy the Grangemouth uh, petrochemical plant? Man, now it's ringing a bell. Yeah, he was infamous because he was asking the workers to uh, forgo their morning tea break, and um, I think he, he had to reduce numbers up there in order to ma- to maximise his investment. Um, uh-huh. Yes, that's okay. the guy. That's the yeah, guy. Yeah. But but anyway, he's only worth twenty one thousand million pound. He's only worth twenty one thousand million pounds. He's got two twenty one billion pounds. It isn't much, George. Twenty one thousand million. It's, uh, it's just and incredible. he's got he's, he's two yachts. There must be a lot of money in petrochemicals. Oh, that's right. He's got yachts. That's right. Because he yeah. laid people off. He sacked hundreds of people while sitting on his yacht in uh, Monaco. Now it's coming back. Yeah, his, his, his two yachts cost in the region of £150 million. Oh, my God. Which, the have-nots, the, the have-yachts and the have-two-yachts. Yeah. But but the issue is, George, he must be that rich, he can't afford to pay his tax because he's now decided he needs to move to Monaco. Presumably, he's finding it hard to put bread on the table. Unbelievable. Guy, look, thanks for all of that, my dear friend. I appreciate it. Uh, an anonymous SMS, George, I wish you were our Prime Minister. So do I. Now, Paul Booker is the man. I don't know Paul. I've never met him, to the best of my knowledge. George Galloway, so good to see so many people tweeting the hashtag Bring Back Galloway. I'm so proud as I organised the Twitter storm. Is there any chance that you can give out my Twitter handle for people to follow me? Well, it's the least I could do, uh, Paul. It's Paul Booker. It's, uh, have I got, do I need anything else? Do I need any other details? Because I can't read them on this screen. Anyway, go for them. At Paul Booker, B-O-O-K-E-R. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I hope I get to make your acquaintance one day. Let's hear from Mike in Newcastle in Staffordshire. Go ahead, Mike. Hello, George. Hi. I'm hoping at the end of this you've got some good news for me, but uh, every time I read about Russia, uh, American and Russia relations, it gets worse and worse. America seems to me to be like a runaway train at the moment. Yeah, it's quite frightening, actually, if you pause to think about it. So, you know, you can laugh. You can laugh. I'm but, not uh, but I'm not sure we should be laughing. Well, we've got the US, we've got aggression from the form of NATO moving eastwards. Every few months, there seems to be another uh, nation going into NATO. We've got the sanctions. I don't think I don't really know they use, they really need scribble, but they're using that. But they'll have sanctions on whatever Crimea, um, and we, as well as that, I think. The, uh, they're a bit out of control, this military-industrial complex. We had examples. Um, we had example in Ukraine. There was a, a general called Breedlove who was running around trying to stir it up as much as he got. When they found out, he wasn't disciplined. Uh, we had Ash Carter, if you remember the ceasefire in Syria. Yep. He, he, I think, ignored it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, they, they're so annoyed. They're really angry over when... Um, 
it, this Syrian thing started when uh, Russia took it off them, didn't they? they yes, they, they, they thought they were going they to achieve to regime bomb. change. They, they can never forgive Russia for depriving them of that. That's what uh, after started, all the billions uh, that they put in to the massacre of hundreds of thousands of people in Syria... Just get absolutely. your head around that, and we're and we're paying for it. And as well. we're yeah, we're paying for it. We're paying. It's absolutely unbelievable. We're, we're, we've been we've spent the last five six years arming, funding, and propagandizing for the kind of people that if we found out they were living in Birmingham, would be arrested in a dawn raid and sent to prison for yeah. thirty years. Go figure. Mike, thanks a lot for that call, Paul Booker. Uh, is the man who organized uh, the Twitter storm in, in my support, and I'm grateful to him. So it's at Socialist Booksy. Socialist and B-O-O-K-S-Y, all one word, at Socialist Booksy. Paul Booker on Twitter. Thanks, Paul. Ditu says, if you need any convincing that hashtag Bring Back Galloway is the right thing to do, tune in to talk radio now and listen to the man himself. Galloway has so much more to offer perhaps more now than he did when he was expelled. Thank you for that. The socialist Vegan says, no evidence of Russian involvement in the elections. Plenty of evidence that Trump is a fascist and a threat to the whole world. Enough reason to impeach. And Rob Chadwick says, my absolute favourite political commentators, Jimmy Dore and George Galloway on the mother of all talk shows. A dose of truth amongst the madness. And he hashtag something I can't possibly repeat, but which I'm sorry to say I entirely agree with. Uh, how did Manchester United go on? Can someone tell me quickly? Jackie O says, Have the Labour Friends of Israel ever commented on the daily butchery in Gaza by Israel? Uh, yeah, they support it. Uh, Art Bennett says, Jimmy had it all together, as usual. Well done, Jimmy and George. Cheers from Melbourne. You see, they're listening to me and Jimmy Dore in Australia. How wonderful is that? The Red Resistance says, what a fantastic 20 minutes of radio. George Galloway and Jimmy Dore, two legends of political commentary. This interview would never happen on the BBC or MSNBC. It would never happen anywhere in Britain, except on talk radio. That's the song in which he mentions Zimbabwe. I bet there's never been a hit record ever before or since that mentions Zimbabwe. Peace has come to Zimbabwe, he says, by which he meant the end of the war of liberation. Not been much peace ever since. Now, every Friday at this time, we're joined by the incomparable British comedian John Maloney. He's not just a stand-up of the very first rank. He's a comedy writer, too, for all kinds of big names. And he's appearing daily at the stand in Edinburgh, at the Edinburgh Fringe. But that doesn't mean he's not got his eye on who's hot and who's not. And he joins us now for absolutely no pay. John Maloney, thank you very much indeed. No, no pay. What? <laughs> surely, surely, I'm surely. Some I'm, mistake, I a, surely. I, I, surely, I deserve a small Glenfiddich at some point. Oh, uh, well, you can definitely have that, though. I can't join yeah. you because I don't. No, but, uh, uh, no, you don't. John, it's how's you, how's your week week. been? First of all, how's your show going it's with Fred Macaulay? Fantastic. Yeah, the, the lovely Fred. We've been uh, doing sellout shows, and it's a it's a you know fantastic vibe up here. And as you know, the, the stand is is here all year as a comedy venue, so people are very familiar with it so it gets uh, it gets great audiences so yeah we've been we've been having a lovely week fred and i and how and, is fred um, i hope you'll give him my regards of course well he's in, yeah he's, he's in great form but the other thing that um it's good about here as well is that they've got another venue uh, called uh, um just in george street the, it's called the Newtown theater which has this fantastic thing in the afternoons if you don't want to watch any comedy in the afternoon oh well you can watch it all the time if you like where they have people in conversation and the wonderful miles sharp i saw yesterday do um in conversation with uh, Jess Phillips, the the Labour MP, it was a it was a very. It was I'm very sorry, I, I'm really sorry, I missed that. <laughs> uh, Jess Phillips, very funny. <laughs> so it was it was very very entertaining, 
Uh, and then today I went to another in conversation with uh, Paddy Hill, who was one of the uh, Birmingham Six. Indeed, was, I know Paddy, uh, yes. Oh, and, and that was an excellent hour as well, talking about, you know, her, the talking about injustice and, and what he's now doing in his life to, to make sure the kind of thing that didn't happen, that happened to him won't happen to others. Yeah. So that's the great thing about the Edinburgh Festival is that it's kind of multifaceted. You have brilliant stand-up comedy, you have these intelligent conversation staff, obviously you have the literary, literary festival and the film festival as well. But the, who I would recommend this week for anybody coming up or for anybody who is in Scotland who wants to come through is a, a comedy poet called John Hegley, H-E-G. Oh, yeah, L-E-Y. John Hegley is a great man, yes. Superb. He's got a show on at 20 past four at the Assembly Rooms over on George uh, Square. It's a very it's good just, venue too, yeah. Yes, and it's a beautiful hour because he does comedy poetry, he does some serious poetry, a little bit of audience participation, but not, not digging anyone, anyone out, not sort of being horrible to anybody, but just gets us to join in. And it's, it was just a, it's just a wonderful piece. And what's great about this year as well is that ticket sales are up across all the venues. It's a really, really thriving festival. The weather's been good, believe it or not. Today was the first day that we had a little bit of rain in Edinburgh for the last uh, seven days or so. So it's, we've had a fantastic sunshine and everywhere is packed. And that's just great to see. I didn't know that this is the third biggest um, selling festival in the world, uh, second uh, to, sorry, third to the World Cup and the Olympics. And then it's the Edinburgh Festival. Is Isn't it amazing? Really? Is it really? Yeah. That is yeah. amazing Yeah, World Cup, Olympics, and then Edinburgh. That's fantastic. Streets are packed. There's lots of street performers and the vibe is just great. Restaurants are full. Taxi drivers for once are happy. <laughs> Did you try that French restaurant I told you about? Not yet, but because I have it, Monday night off, that's where I'm going to... Excellent. To, Please to, do. To and with, bring, um, me bring me the receipt. Bring me the receipt, and I'll reimburse it. Uh, thank you so much. I went to a great Indian restaurant called a Dishoom, which is just uh, on St. Andrew's Square. So if anybody's looking for bespoke uh, Indian food, it's good. It, the, the chef is from Mumbai. Superb Excellent. stuff. Superb. So it's a great festival, George. And uh, but I guess you don't have time to be coming up at all over the next. I don't week. know. I'm I'm working, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, uh, depending on your point of view. Uh, I won't <laughs> make it this year. But maybe oh, it'd be if Jess Phillips can have uh, an in conversation, maybe I should. Would, uh, maybe I should well, book somewhere and do that next year. Absolutely, it would be you. The the crowds would, would would be around the around the block for you. So I mean, she had a, she had a healthy crowd. Don't get me wrong. And it was it was interesting. A lot of the stuff she says. I mean, I, I have met her before, and she knows that I'm at the Corbin end of it all. But yeah, so we kind of agree to we agree to differ yeah. on, on on many things. But it was just great to see 200 or so people listening to somebody who's relatively new to Parliament talking about her her new experiences in Parliament. She's only been in since 2015. Hard to believe just, that. Yeah, Seems to have been haunting us for many many more yeah, years than that. Will. John but Maloney, you will. are a star. I oh. promise you, bring me that receipt and I'll gladly reimburse it and tell them I said You're a legend you. yourself, mate. You're a legend, sir. And I mean, it's always delightful to speak to you. Thanks, Paul. John Maloney will be back next Friday at the same time with his Edinburgh Festival Fringe Report. What a beautiful, beautiful love song that is. What a talented man Stevie Wonder is. Almost unbelievable, the man who writes about things and sings about things that he has never seen, has no idea what anything in the entire world looks like. And yet such poetry, such honey words come from his pen and come from his lips. Let's hear from Lizzie Fletcher in Gloucester. Always a pleasure. Lizzie. Hi, George. Hi. How are you? Good. I'm fine. Fighting fit. Oh, you sound fantastic. Thank you. You sound on top form. Thank you. I wanted to talk about, uh, well, a number of things, I suppose. Uh, Tony's uh, brand new um, platform. Yeah. Why is he shy to talk to me about it? (laughs) He's not shy. The thing is, it only launched last night, so, of course, it's still teething. And uh, he wants to, he he will, well, he says he will ring you himself. I hope so, yeah. It's called Ticket, is it? Yes, T I K K I T. And, and the idea K. is that uh, that it will rival Twitter. That is a fantastically ambitious project. Of course, he doesn't <laughs> mean he doesn't mean rival immediately, but it's an alternative to Twitter. Yes, and the the fact that it's already it's already showing up as a as a platform that can 
rival Twitter is just absolutely amazing. It's a great idea. Uh, you see, that's the real answer to all these questions of censorship and so on, is to have a thousand flowers blooming. Exactly. And uh, any threat uh, to censor, close down uh, and deprioritize, uh, marginalize voices should lead immediately to those voices getting together and building their own platform. And that's what our Tony has done. Exactly. And independent media, UK, are rapidly joining. Well, that is very good. Yes. I and joined I something today. To I wrote my first piece today for a site called Political Provocateur. Oh, Do you brilliant. know it? It's a good name, isn't it? It is, yes. Yes, Agent we, provocateur, political provocateur. I like provocateurs. <laughs> <laughs> we published the meme with uh, political provocateur with you on it. Oh, really? Um, yes, with Fantastic. the, with the uh, bring back Galloway. Oh, the hashtag. hashtag. Yeah, how's it doing? It was at number three. I hope it's going up, not down. Well, it depends, on, of course, on what account you're looking at. Ah. It counts tailored for you. Okay. So... On my personal account, you're, um, you're third. But uh, on my Unity News account, you're about fifth. But still... I'm still trending uh, in the middle of the summer <laughs> when a lot of people are away and very little notice. Uh, right. it's, uh, it's fantastic. I'm really chuffed uh, by it. Sorry, Lizzie, I interrupted you. Go on. No, well, that, that was all right. I was only going to say about uh, the, the hashtag and the creator of it. And when he gave a shout-out, it was the night before last, I think, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, um, it's only been two days in the making, yeah. Yes. So um, is he have... one of your cadre, Paul Booker? No, he's not. No, he's, a, he's an independent guy. I don't know him. You see, there's so many good people all over the country. Exactly. And we're all pushing in the same direction. We are. And, and I think, you know, we've got this Socialist Sunday hashtag. That's yes, what it I've been following from. that, yes. And, uh, you know, on the Socialist Sunday, everybody follows everybody who, who is a socialist. So you're, so, making, you're making a network. Exactly, exactly. We're, we are building socialism from the ground. <laughs> well, Lizzie, my, my, I don't have my hat on because I've got my cans on, but uh, if I did, I'd take it off to you. Thank you very much indeed for that lovely call and all your work. John is in Thursk in North Yorkshire. Let's hear from him. Go on, John. Hi, George. It's good not to talk to you about the environment. Oh, yes, yes. Good. <laughs> it's about the World War I thing. Yes. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the, the Franz Fischer thesis. No. The World War One. He's a, um, a good academic from the 60s, um, and his thesis was essentially that the German high command was so worried about the SPD in Germany in that kind of, from 1905 to 1910, that they kind of um, decided that, that, that the a war strategy was a way of destroying the influence of uh, socialism. Well, uh, I mean, war is uh, uh, always a resort for the ruling elites, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote uh, my history dissertation around this, around the, what was called the... Uh, the suffrage storm of, of 1906, where there was kind of mass riots in Hamburg and so forth, and Red looks Red Wednesday. In fact, it was called became known as Red Wednesday in Hamburg. Um, the influence of Luxembourg and so forth and so on, you know, was immense. So the, the German ruling elite thought they could kind of divert that into, into a preparation for war and getting people. You know, the, the same jingoistic thing that Thatcher did, a la uh, the Falklands and so forth and so on. And uh, am I right in my, uh, I won't call it a thesis because you've done a real thesis, but in my argument that uh, that Germany wanted, with its uh, vastly, rapidly increasing economic power and industrial base, it wanted a share of colonies, and the other imperial powers weren't too keen on that. I mean, I, I kind of slightly disagree with you on this, because they could have become hegemonic in Europe economically without the war. But the, 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 it was more of the political forces that went alongside that that was pushing this. 
you know, the, the imperial high commands of all the, the big powers, you know, the arms race of the dreadnoughts. You know, once that had started, because it was nearly a war in 1912, I think it was 1912, could be 1910, the Algerian crisis. Yes. That was very a close-run thing. So there was a number, but was never not going to be a war, in a sense. All the forces were there. I mean, you're right in the sense that they were all imperial powers. But I think Germany had to, to, uh, was divided whether it wanted a kind of blue water strategy of having colonies in, you know, direct colonies in, in, in Africa, etc., or whether they just wanted to dominate and become he- hegemonic in Europe. And I don't think it was a clear-cut thing whether they were going to go for one strategy or the other. But it was in certainly imperial rivalry. Well, they've certainly achieved the latter uh, in uh, through peaceful means, through yeah. economic uh, strength, and uh, they are now, of course, the dominant country in Europe. That's fascinating, John. I really appreciate that call. This really is the University of the Airwaves. So that's from 1963 until now. Isn't that amazing? It's even longer than I've been going. I joined the Labour Party when I was 13. Stevie Wonder was top of the charts when he was 13. And Tad says, uh, George Cameron used to say, the next big scandal to hit politics is lobbying. Well, it hasn't happened yet. So I asked myself, why the hell not? It surely cannot have passed the public by that he who pays the piper calls the tune. And because of nepotism, the wants of the people can go to blazes. I'm deadly serious when I say we need a revolution in the West to get rid of corporate lobbyists altogether. Regards, Tad. Here's the legend. That's Norma in Bristol. No show is complete, Norma, without your lovely voice. <laughs> I expect I get, get on your nerves, really. Not at um, all. <laughs> We'd be very worried if we didn't hear from you. Uh-huh. What would you um, like to say? I, well, I've got one serious thing. I've got a joke, which, quite honestly, it made me laugh so much. I'm going to tell it you. OK. All right. Um, on my local radio station uh, the other morning, it said, um, um, asking people what lie upset you as a child. Um, and this person texted in and said, my mother told me when the ice cream van came down our street and rang the bell... It meant they had no ice creams left. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> made me laugh, good. you know. Um, uh, no. Maybe I should try that one. But then there's no ice cream vans now, is there? No, no, no none in my street anyway. Them. No, we don't. It's a shame, really. Yeah, a lot of things don't. They just go I'm away. So, I'm so old, Norma, that the ice cream vans were all staffed by Italians when I yeah. was a kid. That's right. Yeah, they, actually, we've got... Tony, Luigi, yeah, right. Frederico, I remember them well. Le Presti. Well, that they used to wear, right. like, a, a little nylon, um, uh, what would you call it, Like almost like a doctor's jacket, not a coat, a short jacket, yeah. Uh, yeah. to keep their clothes clean from the ice cream and so on. And Very fine. They used to wear shirts and ties, and they were actually really Italians. Yeah, I think they were. We've got one down here in the press. You're still going, but they don't come around the streets anymore, you know. Anyway, the so thing... So why that, is that? Because they'd get robbed or what? I don't know. I think it'd be lovely. We'd, um, my husband and I don't move very fast, but I'd love them to ring the little bell and go and get a nice creamy yeah. ice cream. But I'm sorry, Norma. If they ring their bell, that means there's no ice cream left. That's Thank right. You. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my lovely for that call. That's Norma in Bristol, without whom uh, no show is complete. I've got such a sea of written material, I must press on. Darren Thompson, listening to the voice of George Galloway and Jimmy Dore on the mother of all talk shows on talk radio, was like honey dripping off the tongue. Absolutely beautiful. Happy birthday for next week, George. Darren, that's such a lovely, lovely tweet. Lizzie says, George, an anthem for you. Don't die of boredom today. Get turned on to Galloway. Don't fear lies or obfuscation. Campaign for Georgia's restoration. Isn't that lovely? That's fantastically good. Wayne Mack says, hashtag bring back Galloway. Not content with sniping the press. Medics are an equally easy target. This is a reference to a young medic, another one, who's just been killed 
in Gaza this evening. Uh, here's an SMS from Miller in Islington. On your highly informative show last night, there were a few references by yourself, myself and others on the book 1984 by Orwell. I wanted to ask your thoughts on how did Orwell have such accurate prior knowledge into what's happening in the world now, way back then? Much like Huxley's Brave New World, I don't believe in coincidence, were these authors initiates in clandestine capitalist or globalist societies, as the late Aaron Russo spoke of Nick Rockefeller wanting to recruit him into the CFR, as seen in a YouTube interview by Alec Jones. Your valuable opinion is needed, George. Uh, I doubt it. Lars Svensson says, bring back Galloway. The silence about the Yemeni children makes it so extremely, almost ridiculously clear that right-wing media and politicians only talk about the equal value of people when it benefits them and never, ever really mean it. I think you've put it uh, very well in a nutshell, almost ridiculously. The current situation with our mainstream media, media is not just pernicious. It is actually ridiculous. Keith and Harpenden says, I certainly never watched the BBC yesterday as I was glued to the Sci-Fi Channel, which is a lot more believable than the state broadcaster's news output. Very well said. And uh, Jeff in London says, Life's just not fair. My enemies who claim they can't stand me tend to undermine me and damage me, make my life generally the more miserable for their influence. At least one of George's enemies apparently listens to him every week and insists on paying his salary via his chosen means of communication with the show. Not only that, he seems determined to indulge George's claim that he's a, gustler, a gutless coward by repeatedly, without fail, declining to call in. Where do you find these people, George? I could really do with such enemies. It is a study. There's a, there's a, a PhD in it, isn't there? Somebody who claims your show is rubbish, hates you, hates everything you say, but doesn't just listen to everything you say, however often you're on, but spends his own money to, to text you, telling you how much he hates you and how bad your show is. Jane A. says, We still have ice cream vans up north, George. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course there are ice cream vans. Uh, when I was in Bradford, uh, there was an, an ice cream van came round uh, our way. But in London, it's a long time since I saw an ice cream van. And Joe Vass says, George, the elite don't care about Yemen, Palestine, Syria, etc. Here in Canada, do you for one second think the average Canadian cares about the plight of our First Nations right now? Hell no, they don't care. So that's been Canada, America, New Zealand, Australia. I think someone was on holiday in Europe. We've, we really are building an international audience here. Keith says, The outsourcing racket supported by the CBI. BBC is free market, so very strange they step in and support free movement. Low pay, which is tax credit supported. And Asgar says, hi, George, I think the bloody thirsty Blairites will be high-fiving the scenes from Yemen. Even worse, they'll be toasting the kids' parts all over the area as the news broke of the missile hitting the school bus. I have no words left for these parasites. Asgar in Ilford. And Eva Bartlett, the famous, wonderful, beautiful, clever and brave Eva Bartlett is listening. And she sent a tweet. It says, Jimmy Dore is indeed. In this case, that was the wonderful James Corbett. You chose an appropriate segment of the clip to start at. Actually, Eva Bartlett wasn't sending that to me and it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, it was nice to see her name. Red Fox says, your struggles have never gone unnoticed. Bring back the mother of all politicians. George Galloway, hashtag... Bring back Galloway. We can work it out. Well, we could work everything out if we listened to the voice of my next caller. For so many years now, 15, more or less, this young man with crystal clear vision 
and the courage of his convictions has cut through so much of the fog of disinformation, misinformation and ignorance. He's the legend. That's Damien in Brighton. Damien, welcome. Good evening, George. Good evening, sir. Um, George, um, I'd like to do some very frank talking this evening. OK. Um, now, I'm sure there are many people in the country who are wondering what on earth is going on in the Labour Party at the moment. Well, I'm one of them, Damien. Well, I, I have spoken to many people, George, who have asked me that question. Um, they are utter, utterly bemused um, that Jeremy Corbyn, a lifelong anti-racist and anti-apartheid campaigner, is being relentlessly attacked um, by the right wing of the Labour Party, by the Tories and by the media, and accusations of racism are being thrown around like confetti. Yep. Now, um, I believe... Uh, and they simply don't understand where this is all coming from. Now, I believe the reason for the attacks on Mr Corbyn uh, are exemplified in a single article that appeared in The Guardian today. That was a particularly bad one, I must say. Go ahead. Well, the article was written by the president of the Jewish Board of Deputies. Yes. Now, to summarise that article, George... In that article, the president of the Jewish Board of Deputies threatened the leader of Her Majesty's most loyal opposition with a ceaseless propaganda campaign, um, which would not stop until the leader of the opposition capitulates and introduces into Labour Party Code of Conduct a code which will prohibit scrutiny of the apartheid state of Israel. This pretty unprecedented behaviour, I must say. Well, in my view, George, and this is my view, um, that article represented um, the sharp end of a propaganda campaign um, being waged at least on behalf of, if not coordinated by, the apartheid state of Israel. Um, and the tool, the weapon they're using uh, to spearhead the campaign, they are misusing anti-Semitism um, as a tool to defend apartheid. Now, I believe this is an interference in British parliamentary democracy, George. And I think that it's not reasonable to expect a single political party to withstand a state-sponsored propaganda campaign to destabilise the opposition of um, our parliament. And I well, believe... if it was any other state, everybody in the country would be saying that. That's Nobody right. would tolerate Russia doing this, for example. Exactly. So we can set aside the Russia chatter because this is a direct interference in the British democracy by a foreign power. Now, I think, George, as I said... This is, you cannot expect a single political party to withstand a state sponsored propaganda campaign. And I believe that we are now at a point where John Bur Burko, as the Speaker of the House of Commons and the representative of Parliament, needs to convene a meeting with the leaders of all political parties in this country to discuss how jointly they are going to neutralise that interference in our parliamentary uh, democracy, George. And also, Theresa May is duty-bound to make direct representations to Netanyahu to insist that the uh, Israeli government cease and desist from this propaganda campaign which is interfering with our democracy, George. Well, these are very powerful uh, points and uh, and accusations. Of course, there are Damien's. If anyone wants to respond to them, 0344-499-1000 uh, is the number to call. I would just add this or uh, um, put this as a slightly alternative point of view. Not that I disagree with what you've said, but I think it uh, underestimates perhaps the willingness for their own purposes of people 
who are not the government of a foreign state, but are merely the internal opponents of the leader of their own party, uh, are contributing uh, to this. Uh, for example, in the last 24 hours, two trade unions, major trade unions, the GMB and Unison, through the form at least of their leadership, have indicated that they are going to push for the absolute capitulation to this lady's demands, the lady from the Board of Deputies who was writing in The Guardian today. So there's two votes. Uh, another Jewish newspaper earlier this week said that another important member of Labour's National Executive Committee, John Landsman, is equally going to push on the Labour Party's ruling body, the existing ruling body, by the way, before the conference and the election of a new body uh, for the uh, complete capitulation uh, to these demands. And doing the maths... It looks to me uh, a very real possibility that the majority in the Labour Party's national executive will vote to make it an expellable offence to call Israel a racist state. Now, um, that would make my membership of it, of course, completely impossible because I will not be gagged. Uh, but if I'm right and that we are close to the capitulation, uh, that means that this campaign, whoever is involved in it, and there isn't any doubt that the Israeli embassy at least has been involved in it, but that doesn't fully explain it, Damien, because there's a large number of Labour MPs who hate Corbyn so much that they'd be willing to use any issue to destroy Corbyn's leadership and, if necessary, destroy their own party if they can't destroy Corbyn's leadership. Damien? Points. Yes, George, I do appreciate all of those valid points. Um, I would say on the issue of the unions, whilst I appreciate that the Labour Party was born from the bowels of the unions... It is none of the business of the GMB to decide a Labour government's foreign policy. That foreign policy will be decided at conference. Um, the, lay, the, union, uh, the unions have thrown their weight about, but with a membership of almost 600,000 and the members contributing almost as much money to the party as the unions, the unions will have to recalibrate um, the uh, relationship that they have with the party. And on the... Um, point of there are mem uh, MPs who many of them are Labour uh, uh, friends or are Labour friends of Israel, which of course should now be renamed Labour friends of apartheid Israel. And in my view, George, I'm quite clear on this point. Labour is a party of equality. We have a zero tolerance policy to racism. Anybody in the Labour Party, be they a supporter, a, a member, an MP or a Lord, if they are associated in any way with an apartheid state, in my view, that warrants automatic expulsion from the Labour Party, George. I, thanks for that, Damien. Thanks for the call. I need to uh, make this uh, point because it's important and because it is 100% true. The principal Israeli newspaper, and may God preserve it, Haaretz, itself, since the passage of the new national law in Israel, says that Israel is an apartheid state. The greatest living Israeli, Daniel Barenboim, the most famous, loved, treasured, respected, admired, Israeli in the world says Israel is now an apartheid state. So Haaretz and Daniel Barenboim can now say and are saying things that you'll get expelled from the Labour Party for saying about Israel. Go figure. Gus is on the line, probably our last caller. Gus, welcome, mate. Yes, uh, thanks, thanks again, uh, George, and uh, uh, a brilliant uh, point there. Uh, 
as you were saying, the apartheid is real, and it is, it's just... Well, look, if you uh, introduce a law, Gus, and if you, uh, if you say that uh, races are going to be uh, separated, that towns, villages, roads uh, can be used only by one uh, ethnicity, one religious group in the society. What's that if it isn't apartheid? Yes, I know. Uh, as, as the same as, uh, uh, well, a bit like the same as Ireland. Uh, uh, Even Ireland was never that bad. Putting, putting borders up. Yeah. And that's, that's what will happen again if we don't have a united Ireland. Yeah, I mean, why why is uh, why is that gone quiet that uh, that campaign, Gus? I would I uh, mean I would have thought that th- there's know, never but, been a better uh, time to get a united Ireland than right now. Yes, well, anything that I read the now, uh, it's so it do be uh, the DUP and uh, their, their views are just uh, they're all biased, they're biased and bigoted and. Well, race and ethno-religious supremacy is not, of course, something that is confined to the Middle East. It's not confined to other countries. It exists in our own country, Gus. As you'll have heard it in Glasgow, as you'll have heard it if you live in the north of Ireland, That is for sure. My old pal Marie McFarlane says I wrote a quick happy birthday verse for George Galloway. Blair ordered George's expulsion, much to my utter repulsion. He hoped to rejoice, to silence his voice, instead triggered George's propulsion. Happy birthday next week, big man. It was mine yesterday. Happy Birthday to you, Marie, and thank you for that lovely poem. I really appreciate it. Now, I may be on next Friday night. I'm going on holiday, but I may find a studio where I'm going, in which case I'll be broadcasting to you from foreign climes. But if that fails, there'll be somebody else here in my seat for one night only next Friday. Let's have some Stevie Wonder, shall we? To play us out. It's been marvellous.